Welcome to this Facebook Live event entitled Seven Proven Ways to Manage Heart Failure. Today we'll be answering questions focusing on managing and living with heart failure. So thank you for joining us for this live broadcast from the famed Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Please start submitting your questions now. Women Heart and AAHFN are excited to bring you this event, and I'm your host, Selena Gore, the CEO of Women Heart. And joining me today is this great panel of three women. To my right here is Dr. Eileen Sheesh, who is the director of the Women's Heart Failure Clinic here at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, Kim Bichelle is a registered nurse and um, heart failure care coordinator also at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and Porthia Dennis is a Women Heart Champion diagnosed with heart failure in 2017. Um, so let's jump right, jump right into it with our first question, and we'll begin here with Dr. Sheesh. Um, what are the best practice guidelines for providing care to patients um, with heart failure? That's an excellent question. So our national guidelines are actually jointly published by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Foundation. And these guidelines uh, provide us guidance as to what we should be doing. Um, uh, you know, so that we provide as best as possible uniform care. Okay. And so um, we all um, are looking for heart failure symptoms and signs when we diagnose somebody with heart failure. So we look for a constellation of symptoms, which is mostly actually shortness of breath mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and signs of, of fluid retention. So you may okay. have swelling in your legs, you may have swelling in your belly. You may require extra pillows to actually you know, uh, re uh, to breathe. Mm, and nice. I can look at your neck and see that you have fluid building up, okay? Once I've established that you have both symptoms and signs, I'm gonna declare that you have heart failure. And then I'm gonna do more diagnostic testing to figure out the underlying cause and the best practice for management. And I, I always, when I'm meeting patients, they always, think that there should be just one test mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually um, should be ordered and it will just answer everything. Right. But that's not the case. So the analogy that I use more often is actually you know, going into a house. Mm -hmm. And when you walk in a house, you can see the walls and the doors. So when we do an ultrasound of the heart, we can see whether the walls are thick or thin and whether they're strong or weak. Okay, and the strength of the, the wall is referred to as the ejection fraction. Okay. So when it's strong, it's called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and when it's actually weak, we refer to it as reduced ejection fraction. My house is actually 100 years old, and all the doors at one time did fit, <laughs> right. but actually as the house settled, the doors needed to be planed. When the heart gets larger, if they get weaker and larger, then actually the doors that were made one side separate. So you're gonna have leakiness. So really important, but that's all I can see with an ultrasound. Okay. Behind the walls, when you buy a house or rent a house, you're gonna know that there's piping and electrical that you need to know about. And you have to find a different electrician and a plumber. And it's no different with the heart. We need the electrical assessed with actually um, an electrocardiogram, which is actually an EKG where we put electrodes and we check the electricity coming out of the heart. And it lets us know whether the electricity is strong or weak. It lets us know whether the, the signal is normal versus abnormal. Okay. And um, so it's very critical to us. But then the piping has to be done separately. And the piping is actually doing a stress test, okay? That's non-invasive. Or invasively doing a, a, a coronary angiogram, which is a catheterization where we actually put dye inside your body and actually then image the vessels to the heart, um, which I refer to as the pipes. Okay. 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 And I often change the wording and I think one person says, well, is it vessels or is it pipes? And I think that that's <laughs> true, that sometimes when we use analogies, the doctors actually um, confuse patients a lot. But, uh, but really, these things are very important. So actually my medicines and which devices I'm gonna use mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. dependent on the strength of the heart, whether mm -hmm. it's strong versus weak. Um, the electrical determines whether or not we need a pacemaker, okay? Um, and 
the piping, if there are blockages in our, our coronary arteries, then sometimes they need fixing. Right. And th that has to be fixed with actually, you know, a balloon, which is referred to as angioplasty, mm -hmm. or a stent, and sometimes bypass surgery. So it does matter, and we do have to do more testing. So right. this is great. And Parthia, can you tell us, um, as a patient, how do you ensure that you receive the highest quality of care along the, the best practice guidelines that Dr. Shisha shared with us? One, you have to be your own advocate. You have to be very proactive. Yeah. You lived in this body for however long. You know it better than anybody else. So you need to express this and convey it mm -hmm. to the provider mm -hmm. yeah. that you're going to. So that's one thing I do. The other thing is I, I prepare for my appointments. And by preparing, what I mean is any questions I have, write them down. Mm -hmm. My mind is as long as my hair is short <laughs> some days. So if I write them down, I won't forget them when I'm in there. And, you know, sometimes the provider is busy. So, but they have to make time for you. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. have one foot inside the door and one foot out of the door. Mm -hmm. Come on in here, sit down. Let's go over these questions I have. Let's go over my medications. Let's go over what is going on with me. How do we arrive at this? Who else do I need to see? And you have to have all your providers get in contact with each other. So they have to open that line of communication. Right. It sounds like you need a lot of confidence to manage your care. How do you help other women when they're trying to manage their care to, to build that confidence? Because I imagine that's been a journey for you as well. Yes, I help them mentor themselves and, and educate themselves and advocate for them. Mm -hmm. I teach them that mm -hmm. through my own experiences mm -hmm. and being a woman heart champion, mm -hmm. which is a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. I do not get paid, but my reward is I'm healing myself internally by helping others. Um, I tell people, I'm a woman that sees. I support, educate, and advocate for other women and myself. So that's how I do it. So it sounds like you do it by sharing your story, really, yes. and helping others to find their own voice and find their own story, yes. which I think is really powerful so for us. Yeah. To get the confidence that you have, do you need sometimes second opinions to actually hear, make sure that the, that the diagnosis is correct? you know, or for you to really feel comfortable. Is that something that you ever thought of when you were seeking medical care? Yes, I actually had to do that because of my insurance. Mm -hmm. um, the cardiologist that I was seeing, my insurance no longer accepted that provider for whatever reason, you know how insurance has changed. Yeah. So when I had my event, I had to go to another hospital that I had not been to before. And there was a cardiologist there who I knew through other friends and colleagues. So I was afraid at first. It was fearful knowing that, you know, this person has been taking care of me all this time. And mm -hmm. I, I had a good relationship mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And now I have to go somewhere else because of insurances. Mm -hmm. So it was it was fearful, but I got over mm -hmm. that fear, talked to him and everything. And he actually did a good job. He he tried to save my kidneys because of the event I had. I, I have diabetes. So from my diabetes, I end up having a heart attack and a stroke October 29th, 2017. Mm -hmm. So four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I could barely walk. And I'm like, what is going on? And I called my daughter and I said, come take me to the hospital. I should have called 911, but I didn't. I called my daughter. She was in the house with me. Uh -huh. I just had to call her from upstairs. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you know, grown adults, you know, you gotta call them several times. <laughs> so she finally came down and she's like, what's going on? I'm like, I can't walk. And so she got me to the car and the hospital was just around the corner, okay. literally right around the corner. Okay. So we got there and they did everything. And we came in and said, you've had a stroke. I said, I, I probably can tell that because I can't walk. He said, but you also had a heart attack. And I'm like, huh? Because I didn't have any chest pain. I didn't have any symptoms, just the fact that I could not walk. So I'm like, okay. So he said, we're going to have to cath you. And they found I was 80% blocked in my proximal LAD. Wow. And I'm like, is that the Widowmaker? <laughs> you know, because you yeah. hear about the Widowmaker. Yeah. So, but it wasn't. So they end up putting a stent in that is a balloon that opens up that vessel. And my ejection fraction was like in the 40s before he stented me. And after he stented me, it was the upper 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I felt much better. So, but my kidneys were not be able to be saved. So I am on dialysis. Okay. And daily, it's a struggle. 
I have to deal with not only am I on a cardiac diet, but I'm on a renal diet mm -hmm. and a diabetic diet. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. on three different diets, which no dietitian has come up with one diet for all for three all conditions. Right. So I have to watch what I eat. I have to, especially the potassium and phosphorus and things for my, not only for my kidney disease, but for my heart disease. So it, it is a daily struggle. And then depression comes in a row right. because when I was doing manual exchanges, I stayed home mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. heart, mm -hmm. I wanted to be out with the dialysis, that, right. yes. Yeah. But right. also, I like to swim, I like to exercise, and as I was recovering, I like to walk. Yeah. I had to take baby steps again, I had to crawl, mm -hmm. and now I'm up to my potential that I was before. So it, it's a struggle, but it's manageable, and you, you know, you have to have a good support system. And my family and friends supported me, Woman Heart supported me. Um, so I'm you coming You brought up a lot of different really mm -hmm. important points. Kim is always talking to let you speak about this, that it's not a cookie cutter. It's not. Your diagnosis, mm -hmm. everything, your management is mm -hmm. all really based on your set of mm -hmm. problems. Right, like we yeah. have guidelines that, you know, are recommended to be followed. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not, and even with the house analogy you gave, we don't mm -hmm. all have the same type of house, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So our <laughs> plan good, has got to be, it's got to yeah, be managed like for that. us. Mm -hmm. And how you have that's different right. conditions that you're battling, taking care of the whole you, yes. right, is very, very important. Another thing I do is I don't spread myself thin anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to, anything anybody asked me to do, I would make time for it. They would say, Portia will get on mm -hmm. it, she will get on it. So I've learned how to turn that on around and say, no, mm -hmm. I can't do it. Because you, you spread yourself thin, and then I, I used to tell my, my coworker, honey, they will have you replaced one minute after you pass out in here. So don't make your job your life, because mm -hmm. they will mm -hmm. walk over you, and probably won't even treat you, <laughs> just walk over you <laughs> and find somebody else to replace you. So you, you can't make yourself thin anymore. Also, you know, with family and friends, we, we put ourselves off as women because we're natural caregivers. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I have to cook for the kids. I got to take little Johnny to the soccer game. Once I leave the soccer game, I got to take Lucy to, to the vo mm -hmm. volleyball mm -hmm. game. You can't do that anymore. Get, dedicate, delegate, and give some of that things to others. So you have to really take care of yourself. Right. And I always tell my patients along that line, I tell my patients, if you're not taking care of you, you can't take care of all your Absolutely. loved ones and the others yeah. you want to take care of. So you have got to come first. Yes. Kim, just to expand on that a little bit, how, how do you help patients who may not have the same confidence as Prothea to sort of mm -hmm. gain that over time to be their, their best advocate in terms of the medical that system? That is a great question. And I think that starts with education because I think the more knowledge we have, we become empowered and I think an empowered woman is a fighting force, Absolutely. right? So if we can educate ourselves, find out what best practices are, if we're not comfortable with that, then we go to a second opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think helping women to recognize their signs and symptoms, when to call the office or to yeah. call your provider mm -hmm. is very important. Right. And I think yeah. the more knowledge you have, the more empowerment yeah. you give the patients. Mm -hmm. I okay. totally agree. Okay. I mean, one yeah. of the things that impressed me, Portia, is the fact that you knew your ejection mm -hmm. fraction before and after. So you knew the strength. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. every heart failure mm -hmm. patient knows that. That dictates actually what medicines you should be getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really important, and you know that, and you can go see another doctor if you're visiting a family mm -hmm. and all of a sudden have a problem. You can relay your story. Really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, as you stated, that the importance of education and you need to know where your reliable sources are mm -hmm. so you have Absolutely. to be able to trust your physicians and, and medical providers but you also need to if you check the websites you know you could find a lot of things that could be quite scary and could also be wrong mm -hmm. right and i think so, that's where women heart also comes in to, to play this role, not as the, certainly not as the care provider, but as somebody who can steer other women in the right direction yeah, to find absolutely. better sources of information. Right. 
Um, we've got a question that's come in here from Nora. So um, the question is, if you have chronic conditions like kidney disease, and we've already talked a little bit about this, and diabetes, how do you manage these conditions with your heart failure? So really the question is around comorbidities and the extent to which um, you need to be especially diligent in managing your care given the multiple diagnosis you have. Maybe Kim, what, what is your experience with with patients that you've seen with multiple conditions. Right, well, and unfortunately, if you're diagnosed with heart failure, it tends to come with other chronic conditions or diseases that are more long-term care, right. like the kidney disease, like the diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for you to make sure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, right? right? If you have your different providers within the same institute, Yes, they can see your information, but if your appointments are few and far between, they're not gonna know what's going on. So it's important that you make sure that you advocate for yourself and tell your providers what's going on. If you're in different organizations, that even more of the bulk of the work even falls more on you, yeah. right? Yeah. To make sure that everybody knows what's going on and that your plan of care is states as it is, you know. And Porky, you, you, I know you've talked about um, writing things down. Can you talk a little bit more about how that helps you to manage your care across providers? I don't miss things because I wrote it down mm -hmm. and I take it with me. But one mm -hmm. thing I do when I go see my providers is because I see four or five different mm -hmm. providers, mm -hmm. I ask them, did you get the note for such and such? I seen them last yeah. week. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. and even if it's the same network, mm -hmm. did you read the note? Go in the computer mm -hmm. and read the note or they'll say, okay, well, I'll have the MA get it faxed over here and then I'll be back in. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little wait, but I don't mind because I wanna get the best care that is offered for me and having all that knowledge provides me that best care. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sheeter, as a cardiologist, how easy is it or how challenging is it to work with the other specialists that, that might be looking after your same patients? I think these are incredibly important points because actually they all, your different diseases, are gonna are gonna change sometimes the heart failure management, mm -hmm. yeah, as well as actually the fact that you may be needing more than just mm -hmm. heart failure treatment, and you may need to see you know a specialist because um, sometimes a heart failure, if your your main problem, let's say you do not have a kidney problem and you do not have anything other than high blood pressure, I could treat that, mm -hmm. and I'd be comfortable treating that. But if you tell me that you have diabetes and, uh, and you have uh, the need for dialysis, I'm gonna say, you know, you may need specialists to actually treat that. My certificate is really only for cardiology, mm -hmm. the heart, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think it's very, very important. And I think that I wanna just use the example of chronic kidney disease as just one, I think it's important, diabetes and, and chronic kidney disease are one of the most common causes of heart failure. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is excellent to use them as examples. And I'm gonna um, use kidney diseases as a, a very obvious example of why it makes a difference from my angle. If you tell me you have bad kidneys, I am not gonna be allowed, based on our guidelines, to use certain heart failure medication. Right. It will be mm -hmm. unsafe for me to be using an right. aldosterone antagonist. I have guidelines mm -hmm. against that it is considered yeah. harmful in certain situations when the kidneys have, have actually gotten to the point of needing dialysis, okay? Mm -hmm. The second mm -hmm. is the fact that actually other drugs like ACE inhibitors and, and angiotensin receptor blockers, those are drugs that if I do continue to use them, I'm gonna need to monitor your kidneys more. I'm gonna need to check your electrolytes and make sure your potassium isn't too high. And so I'm gonna change my practice. Mm -hmm. I am going to have to tailor my care towards your need. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last is I may even choose to avoid those drugs altogether. Right. And I may instead say, I'm not gonna use those two, okay, or three. And I'm gonna instead use nitrates and hydralazine. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really need to know your medical disorders Absolutely. to decide. And that's just yeah. for kidney. Mm -hmm. And I would be not providing you good service if you had reached a point of dialysis and I didn't mention that a specialist is going to have to decide when you get hormone therapy to build your blood count back up because one of the things the kidney does is actually tell our bone to make blood. Mm -hmm. And so you probably get you know, erythropoietin, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not a heart failure medication. 
And right. you probably use also phosphate binders to actually prevent complications related to, to phosphate and calcium. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's not something I normally right. prescribe. Right. So I'm gonna need to actually, you know, make sure that you have a specialist and if if I fail you and I actually don't suggest, I love how you're an advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. You say, I have this disease and I need to know if you can do that. But I think I'm gonna go back to Kim's point and your point as well, that it is challenging. If your specialists are actually within you know, the same institute, I can open up the records. Mm -hmm. But you also pointed out that if things are actually spaced in time, I may not know you had an appointment right. mm -hmm. with all your meds and changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's so, why if you adjust your heart failure regimen based on exactly. what your kidney doctor does, yeah. that's why it's important yeah. to pick up the phone and say, hey, I was just at my kidney doctor and mm -hmm. they told me to adjust this medication. What do you yeah. think? Right, and, and as you already said, Berthia, the idea that you are the, one, the only one that's gonna know everything that's mm -hmm. happened throughout mm -hmm. your life, but also throughout your medical, the course of your medical treatment, right? I mean, right. that makes you your, your best case manager, really. The other thing as yeah. a patient you can do is after the visit summary, keep those and take them yeah. to your mm -hmm. other appointments yeah, exactly. also yeah. because that has yeah. the record Absolutely. of what they did. And that Absolutely. helps you. It helps I love you. how yeah. you also make me yeah. comfortable that you actually say, hey, did you know? And if I say no, you're like, go ahead, go read. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want yeah. you to be able to provide good care for me Absolutely. right at this moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Let's, we've got a, a good quick question from Harriet. Um, how often do we need an EKG? Is there a, a recommendation for how often that needs to happen? No, I think it's going to be based on kind of the, so initially, when we were making a diagnosis, we have to figure out the underlying cause and try to understand things. So you are going to get an EKG as part of the diagnostic testing, okay? Okay. However, you know, when you actually, your underlying diseases were diabetes mm -hmm. and, and um, kidney disease. So for diabetes, when you, you did not have chest pain, crushing chest pain, you would say yeah. shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know? If that is a heart attack, because diabetics actually only um, really have shortness of breath, it's really less common for them to have crushing chest pain. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to differentiate between your shortness of breath that is due to fluid mm -hmm. versus your shortness of breath due to an heart. ongoing yeah. heart attack? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there are going to be symptoms that she's going to tell me that makes me want to do that. If you say mm -hmm. I'm having um, irregular heartbeats, or that my heart or, you know, is racing, um, or a fish feeling. Of, uh, sometimes people will say that mm -hmm. it feels like a flopping mm -hmm. fish in there, then I'm gonna order an EKG, okay? okay? But otherwise, I may not. So it really based is on based on, you know, I mean, she's such an amazing patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, she's talent, she knows how to, she knows enough about her body. As you said, you, mm -hmm. you're the only one who's lived in it, so you mm -hmm. know when something's right. off. Yes. Yeah. Now my yeah, cardiologist yeah. does the EKG on me every six months because I have to see him every six yeah. months. So okay. he does it every six okay. months. He does the echo yearly. And if I'm having any issues, like he just completed a stress test because yeah. I was having a little palpitation. Mm -hmm. So he completed a stress and it was normal. So he doesn't do the stress test as often, but he does do the EKG and the echo okay. on a scheduled right. basis. And that's why I think helpful. it's so important that we call in to our mm -hmm. provider's office with our increased symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yes. it's yeah. different Absolutely. than what you've been feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. You need to call in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And if they have 24-hour call in, you know, they have somebody on call mm -hmm. that has access to your records. But if you can't get anybody seek treatment, go to the ER. Yeah. One stop shop. You'll get the EKG, you'll get the mm -hmm. echo, you'll probably get the chest X-ray and all that, the good work up, the blood work and everything. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't pan out that it's that, you still sought treatment. You want to be safe than sorry. Right. Right. No, um, very, mm -hmm. So Nicole is asking, um, are there self-management techniques that patients should be aware of that should be paired with their traditional treatment regimens? So Parthia, what works for you? Well, I do have a pill box that I use to take my pills that I set up in so I won't have to have all of those bottles out and get confused sometimes. So they're mm -hmm. all set up in there and I just take it out and take it. I write down things. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. keep my appointments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ask questions. If something is not right, I will ask, you know, what do you think, doc? Or, or I do see a nurse practitioner also. Mm -hmm. What do you think, mm -hmm. you know? Um, 
and I'll tell them, well, I was reading whatever, and this is what they're saying. D do you follow those guidelines or do you follow those practices? So we have that conversation. So you mm -hmm. have to be proactive in your care. I go to my appointments. Mm -hmm. I do what I'm told to do. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. asked to do when I when I have those tests yes you know being in PR after midnight nothing by mouth after midnight sometimes don't work for everybody That's so right. but you have to right. make sacrifices for your own health mm -hmm. so you and have I to do and like how you said being proactive that's yeah. so important because yeah. when you have heart failure it just does not affect your heart right yeah. I mean it affects mm -hmm. Everything, everything with your life. Yes. You have to make a complete yeah. lifestyle change. Yes. You know, now you're eating a different diet, you're taking all these medicines, you can't do the activities that, you, you, that you're used to doing. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that we're taking care of all of us. Right. right? We're taking care Absolutely. of our mental health, our mm -hmm. spiritual health, right. our emotional health. And Can, so to, just to, on that point, um, to what extent has your involvement with Women Heart helped along the, the more non-medical mm -hmm. aspects of support and, and care? It has helped me mentally and emotionally, knowing that it's other women out there. Because mm -hmm. when I first got involved with Women Heart in 2010, I found them by a fluke. I was on the oh, internet just wow. searching some things, uh -huh. and Women Heart came across. I'm like, let me see what this is. I'm nosy. Let me see what this <laughs> is. And I'm like, oh. At that time, I was just having palpitations that the cardiologist at that time that I fired okay. told me it was trivial. I'm like, well, you don't feel them. I'm the one yeah. feeling them. Yeah. And I'm like, let me go into this. So then I went to the Mayo in 2010, did the, the training, and found other women who had mm -hmm. similar or other things. I mean, there's women walking around with the vats on for their hearts, waiting on heart training. I'm like... Now that's a strong sister, <laughs> you know. They have to get prepared every day with that, you know. They have to wear the mask, that's they right. can only drink bottled mm -hmm. water, you know, they're under these restrictions. And I'm like, and here mm -hmm. I am complaining about some palpitations <laughs> at that time. So, but it has helped me through my journey, heal emotionally, mentally, learn the reciprocal process of learning new things from them on top of what I know. So mm -hmm. it, it has really, really helped me and my family. Because I'll tell them, go That's to Woman Heart, read that. Mm -hmm. Can uh, I ask a, a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the, um, so I, I, uh, one of the things that you mentioned about being able to take your pills was actually mm -hmm. using a pill box. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they come in like small little dainty things that are very cute, mm -hmm. that are circular right? Mm -hmm. Versus actually something that is very practical that actually is, you have a lot of pills, right? I would mm -hmm. assume with, with the other chronic diseases. So what kind of pill box do you use? Are you using one of those little dainty ones or are you actually using I a very use, large? I use a seven day one yes. and it has the, and the four sections with AM, noon, evening and then bedtime. Right. Oh, this is all right. about being very mm -hmm. practical right. and Absolutely. really, really important because she has a lot of meds. Mm -hmm. And so the tip. things that my patients have taught me over time to, to really best actually take your pills and, and be proactive is actually first organizing them. Mm -hmm. You do them probably, mm -hmm. my guess is on one day, you get them all organized in advance for mm -hmm. the week. So she doesn't have to do it and scramble mm -hmm. at the last minute and say, oh, where did, you know. She also then knows when she's running low on her meds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second is that some of my patients will actually carry their medication with them. You can buy these keychains that mm -hmm. are pill boxes. Mm -hmm. They look mm -hmm. like a little I don't know, a little uh, plastic container with a screw on top that are waterproof. They're really like, they could be a dollar or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they're on a lock and, uh, and a keychain, and you can just be on the go. So you don't end up having to feel confined to your home. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that my patients have, have taught me is very helpful so that you take those pills are actually setting the phone and the alarm on the mm. phone and using that. And when people don't know how to use their phone, they have their grandkids, and somebody right. else actually set the alarms mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So they remember to actually take their medication because if you miss your yeah. meds, yeah. you're likely to get it you know, um, more hospital visits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we've got a question here from Pam, and we've sort of already started to delve into it, but maybe we can go into to it a little bit more. And the question is, 
Um, how can women be proactive with self-care and what do, what do you do when they're experiencing symptoms? So maybe Kim, what has your experience been in terms of women being proactive versus sitting back and waiting till it might be too late to go in to seek care? Mm -hmm. Well, I think being proactive is the foundation to managing your heart failure. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Being proactive. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as women, we tend have a tendency to, oh, take care of everybody else. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't feel well today. I'll feel better tomorrow. I'll feel better tomorrow. But if you make that phone call to your provider's office with those symptoms, like you said, you might prevent going into the hospital. Because mm -hmm. if they can make some type of medication adjustment over the phone and keep you out of the hospital, that's a win. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I agree. So, but being proactive and, you know, following your diet, being, having activity, yeah watching your fluid intake, taking your medicines. You know, mm -hmm. the medication regimen is very complex for a lot of our yes. heart failure patients, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask for help either. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a family member or a caregiver that's willing to assist and help, don't be afraid to sit down together and fill that pillbox together. Because yeah, it is confusing. Yes. It can be very no, confusing. It's very confusing. Some idea. meds are three times a day, some yeah. meds are right. once a day, some are twice a day. It right. is quite confusing. And you may be taking it differently than somebody else because mm -hmm. your doctor said you need to do it this mm -hmm. way. Yeah. So it is uh, definitely very confusing. Mm -hmm. Any other tips in terms of being proactive? I, I think what's interesting is, you know, in, in listening to your experience, Worthy, and also what you said, Kim, about that being foundational to your heart failure management, is we've had, many of us have had some kind of a symptom where it does get better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay, well then that was nothing. But I imagine that f f for, for a good number of us, we should probably still seek care, even if it resolves it on its own. Yes, you I should. So. Mm -hmm. Two weeks before I had my heart attack and stroke, I was at Mayo. And when I got off the plane and walked down the ramp at Dayton International Airport, I started feeling short of breath, a little more tired. And actually another passenger said to me, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And I was on the phone talking to my friend, and I said, girl, I think I should go to the ER. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she said, why? And I said, because I'm feeling a little short of breath, a little tired. But by the time I got to the car, I felt fine. So I said, I ain't going to go. Mm -hmm, so I did mm -hmm. not go. And then two weeks later, yeah. I had the event. Mm -hmm. So I should have went two weeks before, and I may not have had the stroke or the heart attack by yeah. early intervention. Yeah. But since yeah. I felt better, exactly, I said, I'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Evan is asking, maybe Dr. Shoes, this is for you, um, are there any new drugs on the horizon for heart failure? Ah, uh, um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, we do have a, a new drug uh, on the market that is um, for patients with heart failure with, with reduced ejection fraction, which means that the strength of the heart is, uh, is not strong. Um, we do have actually a new combination pill um, that is combined with an old drug called Valsartan with a new drug called Sucupitril. Okay. But it's one pill and you take it twice a day and it has reduced heart failure um, hospitalizations and death uh, for patients actually that were symptomatic with heart failure. Okay. So that is probably the latest new drug on, uh, on the market. Okay, great. Um, let's move on to our next question here from Lucy. And the question is, um, women tend to ignore their symptoms, we just talked about, <laughs> and do not seek care in a timely manner. Um, when is it time to seek care advice around symptoms? But I think we've answered that question, but I guess the point is that if you, back to Portheus' starting point of, we are the ones that have experienced our bodies the longest. If you feel something that's not normal, mm -hmm. I, I mean, is that right? That that's yes, where I you would so. start Stop. in terms mm -hmm. right. of seeking care, seeking right. advice, or mm -hmm. guidance. And I, I I'm go sorry, ahead. Kim. I just tell people if you can't get in touch with your provider, go to the ER. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't go to urgent care. Mm -hmm. They're not equipped. Mm -hmm. Go to the ER. You'll get the whole workup, and at least they can start off with that workup. And if it's nothing, you have that initial workup where you go back to your provider and say, hey, I went to Good Samaritan Hospital and I had these symptoms and they did all this. They can get all those records. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a starting point mm -hmm. for them where they won't have to redo mm -hmm. those things. Right. So 
seek out treatment when you have those symptoms. Right. Don't Prithi, put it off. You, you also mentioned that there is a difference in what was available at an mm -hmm. urgent care versus an emergency room. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we all have been to the emergency mm -hmm. room, including myself. Mm -hmm. and, and we all have the same experience. It doesn't matter where you live mm -hmm. at all. Um, it's a long wait. Yes, and that's what way. prevents everybody right. from wanting to, yes. want to go. Yes. And so you're kind of <laughs> just saying, oh, I, I, it passed. Right, right. I'm so right. grateful. Right. But if it felt wrong, like something mm -hmm. was wrong, like you, you, I mean, you looked ill enough that another passenger on the plane said, mm -hmm. are you mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So something was very wrong. And you mm -hmm. said that if, if I was gonna go seek help, I was gonna go to the ER. Mm -hmm. And so you knew there was a distinction between the two, right? Yes. I mean, and mm -hmm. I, and that's important is that mm -hmm. I think that we think that there's this magic box that some medical provider is gonna open and be able to mm -hmm. tell us what's wrong with us. But sometimes mm -hmm. we need all those diagnostic tools. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so we have a special tool for our electrical, we have a mm -hmm. special tool for mm -hmm. our piping, we have a special tool for the strength of our heart. Mm -hmm. And then let's say we have other diseases. Mm -hmm. We may need more tools. Right. Right. And so mm -hmm. actually Absolutely. your point is well taken that if you feel like something is more serious, you mm -hmm. probably should go to the ER mm -hmm. right. and it's worth your time. That's why I think it's so important that the minute we have a change in our normal baseline symptoms, mm -hmm. we call our doctor's office, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you're short of breath and you know, you can, last week you could have walked around the block, but today you can only walk halfway around the block. Mm -hmm that's a change in a symptom. So mm -hmm. now you're gonna call your doctor's that's office a great point. so that you can avoid having to go to the ER and wait the long waits. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Well, that, yeah. that reminds yeah. me, all of a sudden I had a flashback of, a, of an event. When someone sees me for the first time, I actually do not know what your baseline is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember somebody actually yeah. walking in, she was probably in her 40s, it was one of my first patients I ever had mm -hmm. um, at the Cleveland Clinic. She was supposed to actually see my partner and she came <laughs> on the wrong day and my partner knew her whole story, but I knew nothing and there were no oh, medical records. Yeah. So this lady comes in and she's shuffling. She couldn't even take a full step and she's in her 40s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing her for the first time and she says, I can't breathe and I'm thinking, okay, but I don't know what her baseline is. Mm -hmm. So she says, you know what? I was running up and down stairwells and working and we didn't have elevators in my building and I had to go up and down the stairs mm -hmm. about right. one to two months ago. So this shuffle that you just saw mm -hmm. is changed, all right? new. Mm -hmm. That was such an incredible eye opener mm -hmm. and I didn't know her baseline. And then she, she, at least thank goodness in her case, she was able to say, it was just a crazy comment. She said, I had surgery, they opened me up, they saw a bunch of scar tissue and they closed me back up. Wow. I had trained in a place with mm -hmm. histoplasmosis. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness I actually had, because otherwise there was probably nothing else that I would have done. Right. Wow. But I immediately knew that she had an infection, infection. causing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Got it. But Got I it. thought, wow. you know, had she not told me her baseline, I kind of right. just see her in a chair. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a dramatic change, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's yeah. plenty of women walking out. Uh, right. Yeah. And there's plenty of women walking out there that have subtle changes yeah. and if you're very in tune to your body and you recognize those and you seek out advice then yeah. you know you prevent yourself hopefully from coming to that dramatic change yeah. right. early right. intervention right. is the key is the key it is that is very well said um, we've got a question from Lynn for Dr. Sheesh and the question is how can we provide education to primary care clinicians regarding HFP EF versus HFR EF so the very first is and maybe you can explain what yeah, those are. what those are. So that goes back to the strength of the heart. Mm -hmm. So I always say everything in cardiology is in a different system. If I am talking to my mom and my brother and sister, I would rate everything one to a hundred, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, and yet we start with the strength being fifty to fifty five percent. <laughs> so. You know, if I'm hearing it as a patient, then my ejection fraction is, you know, 30. I would be like, oh my God, I have yeah. only a third left and I'm about yeah. to die. And that's, that's not, not the true. case. Yeah. So low normal is actually 50 to 55%. And so if it is actually at the 50% or above, we call, and you have heart failure, we call that preserved ejection fraction. 
And if it's less than 50, we call that reduced. And so that's our first uh, set of uh, distinctions. Got it. Got it. The other is that medical management changes dramatically, and that's why they were asking that question. Okay. Um, and, and who gets the two diseases is very different. Mm -hmm. um, women, since this is actually yeah. about women yeah. <laughs> and heart disease, women are more likely to have hearts with stronger that are stronger than men mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so okay. we are more likely to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in fact men are more likely to have reduced ejection fraction mm -hmm. in fact if i even go take it further and you even look at heart transplantation the percent is low and i'm often asked is that because we're actually not taking care of women and part of that, we don't have real answers because we haven't done a survey across the whole United States to be able to know who has a weak heart versus who has a strong. But actually, the odds are women are not going to have a, a reduced ejection fraction. They're going to have a preserved. Mm -hmm. So the those that have weak hearts are going to actually um, be more likely eligible for mm -hmm. a heart transplant. And when we get heart failure, we're often older, not in, in your case, um, because you actually had actually coronary disease, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is more um, likely to occur in men than women. Mm -hmm. But your underlying disease, which is diabetes, mm -hmm. okay, is about 40% of the patients out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you were now in a bucket that puts you really at high risk of, of heart attacks mm -hmm. and why our medicines actually are to assume you have it and be very aggressive with our care. Um, so I'm not really answering, but our medical therapy um, does depend on, on whether it's reduced or preserved. And right. we have a whole set of guidelines on what to do when you actually have reduced because we have a lot of different strategies. Okay. When we actually okay. have preserved, we really don't have great strategies. That's a bummer. Yeah. So what we do have is to actually prevent symptoms and fluid retention. So we actually use a lot of water pills. We mm -hmm. control your blood pressure because that's one of the most common causes. Mm -hmm. And atrial fibrillation, when you have those palpitations, um, you know, those are, are um, things that actually the heart goes too fast. Mm -hmm. If it's going too fast, it's not filling with blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it's not filling, where is the blood going? It's staying back Stay where the last right. tank was, mm -hmm. which is right. your lungs. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So you end up with, with, so we actually control the heart rate in AFib, slow it down. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it's a preserved ejection fraction with AFib in order to actually try to get control so that they don't have as many symptoms of heart failure. So um, our medical management is very different and we have more to offer when it's actually a weak heart than when it's a strong heart and yet there's opportunity mm -hmm. and I would say that when we have opportunity women need to participate in those trials because mm -hmm. we absolutely need to provide good care. And I think we often uh, hope that somebody else actually will volunteer. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of my biggest concerns is how do I know that drug will work for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what really worries me, mm -hmm. is that when we are underrepresented in clinical trials, I do worry whether or not that mm -hmm. drug will work for you. And I will not assume that we're all the same. We're not. Mm -hmm. we're not. Mm -hmm. It just sounds like a we're really not. complex issue mm -hmm. that needs a lot more attention. Um, and so the question around primary care clinicians sounds like it's, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a, a contentious point in the sense that there's still a lot of complexity even for a specialist cardiologist. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the, the primary care folks are probably um, needing an even higher level of understanding that they, than they currently I have. Think, uh, for us, we're, we're really focused on for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or treating the underlying disease. So if you have high blood pressure, get it under control. If yeah. you have AFib, get it under control. If you have, um, if you have uh, which emphysema, you know, um, get your oxygen under control because actually when your oxygen is not okay, if you are struggling to breathe and don't want to wear your, mm -hmm. your actually um, oxygen, your supplemental oxygen, you're more likely to have a rhythm disturbance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so all these things interconnect. We're one person and complex. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. It's definitely complex. Um, 
Let's go to Brenda. She's got a question here. Are there any special considerations and or issues for women with heart failure? I guess this is compared to men. So um, maybe with Kim, like what, what have you seen in you comparing your heart failure patients that are men versus women? And what, what do women need to pay attention to especially? I think women in general, they, um, well, they develop heart failure later in life, correct? And a lot as of a times, whole. as a whole, the reason is hypertension, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think preventative care is very mm -hmm. important for mm -hmm. women. Um, seeking their primary care doctor, doing their annual checkups, and being proactive with their care. As far as other differences, I have to say I haven't really noticed you know, a difference in management per se. Um, they still struggle with the same symptoms mm -hmm. that men do, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they just, a lot of times women do have a tendency to hold back on their symptoms, just like mm -hmm. we've discussed before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, that's really the differences I've seen. Do you have any other Yeah, I was gonna say, my, my whole research has been right. focused on this. And so I would say, actually, the two things that you just mentioned, uh, the fact, actually, for symptoms, we do have similar symptoms. There was one study called the SOLVE study that actually addressed whether symptoms were slightly different. And so you're still going to have shortness of breath, but they noticed that women had more shortness of breath, that they actually were more symptomatic than men. So we really should seek help mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. we have symptoms. Mm -hmm. The other is when we look at advanced heart failure, um, and I um, focus my, my research on actually on the heart transplant national wait list uh, waiting. Women tend to die at a faster rate than men. And when we were looking, why didn't they get the advanced care? Why didn't they get the machine that you were talking about earlier? You know, part of that was because the machines actually did not fit in the women. So that's been now completely oh, wow. addressed. But the other was the fact that actually women presented really late. Mm -hmm. And when we've looked at our, our database for the whole United States, that has been a concern, um, that there has been some suggestion that women are coming in really advanced. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that brings home the second point. I think when you look, I'm gonna just ramble if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But um, women actually, so for the most part, we have the same symptoms. It's not like heart attack where we, you know, where the men get more crushing chest pain and the women get more shortness of breath. We all have the same symptoms. Mm -hmm. Women may have more than men of the same symptom. The second is the fact that we actually have a different underlying disease. Men are more likely to have heart attacks as the cause mm -hmm. and blockages. Mm -hmm. Women are more likely to have um, uh, clean coronaries. You are not that person, but usually our piping is clean mm -hmm. and we call that non-ischemic and that is the more common for us. Mm -hmm. We tend to develop heart failure older compared to the mm -hmm. men. They have heart attacks at a younger age than women and so they actually have uh, weakened at a younger age and we tend to uh, develop um, heart failure as we get older and high blood pressure is one of the most common causes. We tend, even though the medications actually haven't been well studied in women, mm -hmm. interesting, we actually as a group, uh, putting us all together, the young, the old, we tend to actually, two different studies were done in a population and they both showed that women live longer than men with, with yeah. heart failure, okay. which is very interesting. interesting especially yeah. if they're coming in at a more advanced state. Yeah. And they're so these are age-adjusted data. Mm -hmm. um, the two main population studies, one you were at the Mayo, mm -hmm. and they have done a population study. Mm -hmm. And the other was in Massachusetts, a population in a small town called Framingham mm -hmm. actually has provided mm -hmm. us the most helpful information right. uh, from that one little town. And they mm -hmm. actually have all done that. And then for medicines, you know, women are actually underrepresented in all the clinical trials. And so when I am looking at, at studies, I have no idea whether this drug is gonna work in you. That's one of my biggest mm -hmm. concerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I went back, um, th so that that's not like a special training that I mm -hmm. get. So when I wanted to learn more, I had to go back to all the studies, mm -hmm. pull out all the trials, and then look to see how many women were in the Each studies. Mm -hmm. And that was about 20% for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. So only 20% women, okay? And then I wanted to know whether the drug worked, because mm -hmm. that's what you want to know. Right. Right. And right. so right. they did this retrospectively. When we do it prospectively, that means that I'm gonna know in advance that I want a woman 
taking the drug and not taking the drug, a woman taking the drug, a woman not taking the drug. And I'm doing it retrospectively. I've just enrolled a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. And then I look in the the group that have taken the drug and I said, oh, how many women are in there? Mm -hmm. And let's say I have, you know, 80. And I look in the other group and I say, how many, how many women are in that one? I could have 20. That's not Mm -hmm. going to be a good comparison because I didn't. So yeah, that's yeah. called a retrospective analysis, and that actually is limited. Mm-hmm. But when, yeah. I, when we did that, when I looked at that data, I found actually that certain drugs were very helpful. Mm-hmm. So aldosterone antagonists, which actually are not really safe in people mm-hmm. with kidney disease, actually seem to work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, beta blockers, all those trials were actually uh, stopped abruptly because mm-hmm. they were so powerful, they were so, so helpful. helpful. Right. They had to stop to make sure everyone got, because if we find out that a drug isn't working, mm-hmm. we don't just let the trial mm-hmm. carry on, we right. stop. Right. Mm-hmm. So women were already, um, you know, underrepresented, uh, and we stopped the trials, and the beta blockers actually have been effective in the women, which is really important. And then I looked to see whether or not the ACE and the ARBs, and really, I think the evidence suggests that they're beneficial in some way. Mm-hmm. There's a little more data to suggest that angiotensin receptor blockers may be more helpful. Okay. Mm-hmm. That is retrospective, so you have to understand there's limitations. Mm-hmm. Um, but more importantly, you know, I have a lot of patients that come in and they're fearful of getting a pacemaker. That's like mm-hmm. their worst nightmare, especially mm-hmm. women. I don't want something right. that sticks out. I don't right. want something. I don't want to have some foreign object in my body, mm-hmm. and and yet these. Um, Special pacemakers that actually work on both sides of the heart, Mm -hmm. called biventricular, they actually work better in women than men. Interesting. Well, that's a great, great segue to Andrea's question for you, Dr. Shishu. If your ejection fraction goes Mm -hmm. up after a pacemaker or defib implant, what does that mean about the condition of the heart? So that's a very good question. So the the average improvement in your ejection fraction after the pacemaker has been placed, the one that's called biventricular, most people feel a lot better. That's mm-hmm. really what, and mm-hmm. everyone expected that you must go to normal. If you feel really like a superstar, you're gonna think, oh, I can't wait for that echo. Right. That's gonna be like <laughs> awesome, I'm gonna have like normal. And actually when they did this, you know, in big studies, it was like only a 5% increase. Oh. That was kind of a bummer, yeah. right? So you actually improve some, but your symptoms improved more. So then there are these groups of patients, very small, that actually go to normal or close Mm -hmm. to it. And we call that super responders. So there are. So Mm -hmm. it does work. And then there are patients actually who get worse. Mm -hmm. Again, a very small. Mm -hmm. And that can be dealt with. So if you feel worse immediately, then something is wrong because it wasn't natural for us to actually get a pacemaker in our body. Mm -hmm. We had to snake it through a vein Mm -hmm. and you and I may not have our veins in the same spot. Right. Right. So if I snake it in the vein that seems to be the one that I'm supposed to put it in, but that's not a good spot for you, you could Mm -hmm. immediately feel worse. Mm -hmm. If you do, I need to know that because I can turn it off. I can keep mm-hmm. the pacemaker mm-hmm. on, but not have it on both sides both because sides. I could be rocking your heart and making mm-hmm. you worse. So mm-hmm. I can manage that mm-hmm. and actually change it. Sometimes we'll even change the position, but mm-hmm. actually that's not as common. We sometimes will just have to turn Don't it off know. because changing the position and pulling a wire out, it scars mm-hmm. down, mm-hmm. it actually can be a dangerous thing. So I don't right. want to suggest mm-hmm. that that can be done. So I would say that actually just you telling me if you immediately felt better or if you immediately uh, do not is very, very important. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Um, we've got a question from Brittany. Um, what resources are available to provide support to women diagnosed with heart failure? Maybe I'll, I'll start just talking about women heart and um, the, the great opportunity it is for women who are maybe new to a heart disease diagnosis um, and want to figure out a way to talk to other women experiencing um, whether it's similar symptoms, similar diagnosis, um, and also want to find a way to help others. Um, Women Heart is, is the only organization in the country that's got that, that laser focus on women with heart disease. Um, and we train women to become advocates, to become community educators, and also to become support group leaders, um, which is I think one way um, that I've seen women really sort of increase their confidence and come into their own, becoming not just, again, support group leaders, but 
um, their best um, case manager and, and support um, for themselves and, and for the people around them who care about them. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say go to womenheart.org and you'll find a lot more information there. But we also partner with a lot of other heart organizations like AHA mm -hmm. and ACC and others um, that are um, providing really good information, not just to clinicians, but to the public. Mm -hmm. And I would all especially like to talk about AAHFN <laughs> because I think for me, um, the nursing role is, is the role in, in sort of um, across our, our healthcare system that gets the least credit and probably mm -hmm. deserves the most. And in, in terms of really keeping that patient engaged um, and understanding their needs um, beyond that, the, the doctor's appointment. Right, and AAHFN, it's mouthful, right? Yes. <laughs> Does have fabulous patient education resources. They have tip sheets that you can download and print off, so that helps mm, you to recognize wonderful. your symptoms, mm -hmm. helps with medications, helps with, you know, there's a tracking thing for your daily weights. There's fabulous tools mm, on there. Wonderful. And I think when we talk about resources, I think it's very important to say that you have to make sure they're credible resources, yeah. Yeah, right? We're getting true. our information from hospitals or like national organizations, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a lot of information out there that could be skewed right and as far as yeah. support groups and advocacy groups we have information at our fingertips now right with mm -hmm. social media Absolutely. and you have to there's mm -hmm. tons of online support groups that yes gives us support so that we know we're not alone but we have to be mindful that that's patient experience mm -hmm. some positive some negative mm -hmm. and just because you're on this you know support group and somebody you know posts why well, I tried this medication and I felt horrible does not mean that you're going to feel that way that's a so really important point. You just have to really point. be mindful Absolutely. when you're in those support groups and those online chats. Yeah. Yes. Parthia, um, in terms of your experience with Women Heart, um, what other resources do you share with women in addition to the ones that we've already talked about in terms of information or you know, understanding um, whether it's a diagnosis or, or a treatment that you might um, have? I also use cdc.gov. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So they have a lot of patient education mm -hmm. on there, and that mm -hmm. is a government um, mm -hmm. website. Yeah. So it's credible. Right. So I do use that one. And I also talk to my cardiologist and ask them, you know, what, what new insights is out there for us? What oh, new great. resources is out there? You know, what do you use? For your mm -hmm. patients, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know that Absolutely. should be credible. Absolutely. So I'll ask, mm -hmm. you know, where do you get your information from? Mm -hmm. That's a good so. question. Yeah, right. that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. right. I'm going to add one more though. Yeah. I also think that the Heart Fire Society mm -hmm. of America, mm -hmm. at least, has tried also to make it a one-stop shop, so that you go to that website. There's a patient. You mm -hmm. actually identify yourself either as a physician, mm -hmm. medical provider, or a patient, mm -hmm. and. Um, there's even one, a tab in there for caregiver. Oh, that, okay. oh have a fantastic. Module that you can print off. It's like a booklet yeah. mm -hmm. that helps if you're a family member or a caregiver. Wonderful. It helps mm -hmm. walk you through so that you can help your loved one manage right. their heart mm -hmm. failure. So it's, really it's a great right. resource. Mm -hmm. So it right. has education, right. you're kind of mm -hmm. the top questions that you would just want to ask. But mm -hmm. then they actually have links. Because okay. every organization, as you said, is not able to cover every exactly. need. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they have a link so that actually mm -hmm. they tell you what the NI latest NIH tri clinical trials mm -hmm. are. Right. So you link to the NIH mm -hmm. trials. Mm -hmm. um, they link to actually, you know, you need these meds, medications can get quite expensive mm -hmm. and they can really get to the point where you have to make decisions, which is horrible. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard from several, you know, should mm -hmm. I get my food or my, my meds? Oh, mm -hmm. right. So that's a horrible situation. And there are links in that website that actually will mm -hmm. find you uh, reduced medication. Mm -hmm. um, they'll also have organizations that actually provide you yeah. money mm -hmm. to cover the cost. And you do have right. the pharmacy shop. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you know, people would think Walmart pharmacy is cheaper. Point, right? And it's not, not always. It's great, right. Walgreens yeah. may be cheaper on certain medications. Mm -hmm. There's no set limit on the cost for these medications. Absolutely. So you right. do yeah. have the pharmacy yeah. shop. And right. then I want to add something about women heart. Yeah. I had this, um, I have a lot of young women. And, and so I have a, there's a, heart failure disease called peripartum, which occurs during pregnancy. pregnancy. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the women are often quite young. And they're, I mean, at a time that they should be joyful, they're really right. overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, beyond, and they feel lousy. And so, um, but the good news is that they recover mm -hmm. to normal mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. more than anyone else. So um, one of my young ladies actually had recovered to normal, 
and um, just emotionally wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every time she came in to visit me, she's still normal, but they were fearful, her and mm -hmm. her husband. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. yes. And I um, asked why, and they were having uh, traumatic stress, okay, mm -hmm. post traumatic stress, sure. stress syndrome, because mm -hmm. they actually sought sure. medical care. I'm sure a lot of this is why a lot of women actually like to go to Women Heart because mm -hmm. they can relay their story and find yeah. out they're not alone. Mm -hmm. That's right. So she had gone to the emergency room multiple times, no one believed her. Um, she was black. She worried whether or not there was racial discrimination, mm -hmm. which may mm -hmm. or may not have occurred. Mm -hmm. I think more than anything, when you see a young person, you think they're healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that was also against her. And she just kept this fear, what happens if I need help and nobody mm -hmm. listens, no one. And I think that they really are out to get me. Right? right, right, and so um, once I understood that, that because she had recovered, she was among the lucky ones, she was fine, and yeah. yet two years later, she could not get to normal mm -hmm. in her mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. So once I, I discussed with her, and she felt, and I kept on saying, there are so many women out there that are like you mm -hmm. that had to seek medical attention many times until someone listened. I said, you know, if you just contact Women Heart. Mm -hmm. You'll hear the story. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I gave her the card, and uh, and now I keep the cards actually at the mm -hmm. desk. Right. Um, but it was shocking. She actually um, came in the next time and was just completely normal. And she said, "You know what? I'm going to go to work now." And she had been normal for years, mm -hmm. but, but she wasn't yeah. mentally she hadn't adjusted because yeah. mm -hmm. she needed to find out. There were others. This feeling yeah. of being she alone is yeah. a sure. yes. right. absolutely mm -hmm. feel. It is that mm -hmm. feeling. And yeah. women heart yeah. really, really changed her life. Mm -hmm. And I think when women can connect with other women, there's something to be said for that. Yeah. Yeah. We empower yeah. each other. Yeah. yeah. It's the sisterhood. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what it's referred yeah. to as. Mm -hmm. It's really important because it really made it gave freedom for mm -hmm. her absolutely. to be able to enjoy life when she had really every reason to enjoy to it. do that. Right. She had a reason to release her fears. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got a question from Amy, um, and I think this ties in really nicely to what we've been discussing about how do family members get accurate information and support. Again, I think this, the, the same um, resources that we just mm -hmm. talked about I think mm -hmm. are also relevant for caregivers and for, right. uh, for family members, and mm -hmm. I like the idea that now increasingly these organizations mm -hmm. are providing caregiver. specific right. caregiver mm -hmm. information, which I think has been a long time coming. Yes. Um, so that's really wonderful. And, you know, we, again, the, they are sort of the unsung heroes oftentimes in our care. Right. Um, I mean, we need to recognize that. They need to recognize, too, that they need a break also. also. And they should not yeah. be afraid to say, I'm here for you, but I need a break. Yeah, right. So because if they break down, that's your support system, mm -hmm. you're left. Yeah, and then you exactly. may regurgitate and regress yeah, back yeah. into other things. Other things, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're we're gonna wrap up, but before mm -hmm. we do, um, a last minute question came in from Anita, and this is um, take takes us in a slightly different direction, but I think still re very relevant. What are the advantages of cardiac rehab? For low injection fraction, so so I, I just think it's it's an interesting you know that that sort of segues into what we'll be talking about the next um, Facebook Live, which is around thriving and cardiac rehab. I think is sort of part of that journey. So who who wants to take that question before I we wrap up? I can easily take yeah. it, but do you do want to go first or? I enjoy cardiac rehab. It was a chance for me to be out, uh -huh. meet mm -hmm. new friends, Wonderful. tell my mm -hmm. stories, share things with them. It was a reciprocal process. Mm -hmm. I learned from them, they learned from me. Mm -hmm. So it was a socialization thing mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. right. I think mm -hmm. cardiac rehab is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And to point out, it is for redu it's for reduced ejection fraction, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. But it not only helps the physical piece for you, but it's also helping the mental piece. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because heart failure can be very it can be very depressive, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't do the things you used to do. And I think the cardiac rehab not only pro provides support, mm -hmm. but it's also helping you physically and mentally. So as you had pointed out, um, first of all, it's not all about exercise, right? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. said there was socialization. Mm -hmm. You probably got education mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. too. So actually, I, I always thought of it as just a place like going to a gym, but that's not really what it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, we have now insurance approval to mm -hmm. actually provide, um, you know, cardiac Wonderful. rehab 
actually when the patient's ejection fraction is uh, is low. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. We right. also have insurance approval if you've had a heart attack, mm -hmm. or you've had the angioplasty, mm -hmm. or if you needed bypass surgery, which thank mm -hmm. goodness you did mm -hmm. not. But those are things that are actually now covered and really mm -hmm. should be done because it does mm -hmm. help people uh, do better. And I think that uh, it also mentally gives you the confidence to yes. go out and Absolutely. do activity. Yeah. Because it is monitored exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not yeah. like walking it's into your local gym and exercising. Yeah. They're there yeah. to coach you and yeah. push you along. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that sort of takes us to the end. I want to thank all three of you. This has been a really fun experience, oh, and also thank I've you. learned a lot. Um, so that concludes our talk today um, on seven proven ways to manage heart failure. Remember to consult your personal, hair, personal health care team with any questions before modifying or changing um, any of your care strategies. And remember to visit um, womanheart.org for more information. So thanks again to thanks. our panelists, and thanks thank you, you to, to the viewers. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>